pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Um, this talk is one of a series that we have been running with journalist Rosie Goldsmith entitled Fashion and Fiction. Rosie interviews very well-known writers and talks to them about their love of clothes and some of, the way, some of the ways in which clothes and dress have inspired both their writing and other aspects of their lives and work. Tonight, we are absolutely delighted to welcome broadcaster and best-selling novelist Sarah Dinant. Sarah will be discussing her popular Italian novels, including The Birth of Venus and Blood and Beauty, which explore the lives of women in Renaissance Italy. This talk coincides with our current exhibition entitled Botticelli Reimagined, which some of you may have already seen, which explores the enduring impact of the Florentine painter Sandro Botticelli from the pre-Raphaelites to today. The exhibition reveals the ways that artists and designers have reinterpreted the, the work of Botticelli through painting, fashion, film, drawings, um, tapestry, sculpture, and print. So it is wonderful this evening to have an author joining us whose work and whose novels are set in Italy during the lifetime of Botticelli, one of the greatest artists of our time. Please do join me in welcoming Rosie Goldsmith, who will introduce you to Sarah and the evening. Hello again. I think there are some of you who are loyal followers of fashion fiction, so it is really wonderful that you've come again. Um, and welcome to those who aren't. We hope to, to get you in our grip and that you come to all the, the future ones we're going to hold. Um, just to give you a little bit of background uh, to those newcomers to this idea of fashion and fiction, because it is a totally new idea. Um, and I'm delighted that we've been able to have some wonderful guests. We started with Margaret Atwood just over a year ago. And um, we've since had Jung Chang and Joanna Trollope and Linda Grant. And uh, so we're going to continue. We hope to get some men as well. They seem to be a little bit reluctant um, to admit that they're interested in fashion and fiction. But um, I have a few insight. So the idea is uh, of fashion and fiction is a series of illustrated interviews. And these are, as Jenny says, they're great writers. And they believe, as I do, in this creative crossover of fashion and fiction. And for me, it's a combination made in heaven to actually do it here at the v &A as well. Clothing and costume have been integral to narrative and character across the centuries and cultures. Now, if you just think of Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales, Anna Karenina, um, Maupassant, Emma Bovary, and so on and so forth, Hilary Mantel and Wolf Hall, and in fact, every single book, either by exclusion or inclusion, can, um, can be relevant in this particular regard. It's the great, what I call the great unexplored treasure trove um, or dressing up box of literature until now. Um, now, as far as our wonderful, wonderful guest, um, Sarah Dunant, is concerned, I want to tell you, first of all, very quickly, how I became aware of Sarah Dunant. Um, it was through, as many of you may remember, she wore these amazing red glasses on The Late Show, um, when Sarah was presenter of this art show, The Late Show. Sarah has been, for so many years, somebody I've always wanted to be and still want to be. She writes now about Italy, which is my favorite country, one of my favorite periods, which is the Renaissance. She's presented uh, BBC arts programs, all the ones that I've wanted to do. She writes the most amazing books. I wish I were Sarah Dunant. Um, <laughs> she's a fantastic broadcaster, writer, critic, thriller writer, um, right at the beginning of her career. She's written 12 novels. Uh, I mean, and four of the latest uh, are about um, Italy and about women of the Renaissance particularly, and it basically using historical fiction to explore what it was like to be a woman in that time. Um, now, Sarah's going to come on now and tell us about everything, hopefully, about Italy, costume, her own love of fashion, and so I want you to welcome Sarah Dunant. Now, I hope you notice um, our shoes. Now, <laughs> There's a reason for this. Sarah is wearing vintage shoes, and I'm wearing new ones. Now, you, your interest in fashion is actually vintage, isn't it? You, you I don't buy anything new. You don't buy anything no, new? No, I buy everything secondhand off eBay or charity shops. Um, I could give you an ecological reason for this, of course, which is um, growth and the ending of growth. But actually, it's because you get a great choice when you go second hand, because you never get three of the same thing in the shop. 
um, and uh, so it's all it's always Fantastic. been but um, but I, I, I'm not sure that I have a style. I was telling Rosie that um, uh, when I was at university, um, I was once in this uh, um, thing called Footlights at Cambridge, which is a sort of comedy sketch show. And um, in the program, the note read, um, Sarah Dunant has the dress sense of Minnie Mouse. <laughs> and I actually couldn't decide whether or not this was a compliment, which I think probably <laughs> shows my reaction. But you... In order to, to write so well about the Italian Renaissance and about, about women, obviously you've had to write about costume as well. Were you always interested in costume and fashion, or is this something you've had to develop in order to write these novels? Well, I was always interested in art, and if you're interested in art, um, particularly through the history, before you get to abstraction, what you're looking at is the human body, quite a lot of the time, reproduced by some of the great artists. And quite a lot of the time, because the great artists were, had patrons who had money, uh, the patrons with money wanted to, to be so, shown what they could wear and what they could afford. So you're looking very early on at uh, extraordinary rec recreation of garments and drapery and the latest fabrics and fashions. And, and it's actually quite a serious business. I mean, everyone may look gorgeous in it, but the having enough money to flaunt it and show it is, is about your status and your wealth. So at one level, it's fashion. At another level, it's politics. Why did you become, why and how did you become so interested in Italy, first of all? Because uh, you divide your time, really, between England and, um, and Italy. I, I which do is, now. Which sounds like the perfect kind of life, yeah. to be honest. Yes. Yes, I have a really difficult life. I mean, that's <laughs> that introduction, right? I can't tell you how painful it is being me. So, um, uh, I, in the year 2000, I had a bit of a crisis, which was both a crisis in my personal life and also a crisis in what I was writing. I'd been writing thrillers up until then, and I was tired of the rules. I was tired of the way every time you tried to get deeper, you hit a plot point. So I didn't know what I was going to do, and I fetched up um, in Florence while my life was disintegrating. I highly recommend a great city when your life is disintegrating. Um, and I, I spent two or three weeks there on my own. And as I suspect anybody here will understand, if you get lost in Florence, which is both metaphorical and literal, very soon you start to say to yourself, what the hell happened here 500 years ago? because it's a small little provincial town on the edge of the west of Italy, which isn't even a, a country during that period of time, and yet it is responsible for one of the beginnings of one of the greatest cultural movements we've ever seen. Um, and, and, so, and I kept thinking to myself, what would it have been like to be in this city with the shock of the new? for to be walking through these streets in the 1490s and everything that you saw from the Brunelleschi new building to um, another piece of Michelangelo architecture or sculpture to a new cathedral, a new um, fresco being built, all of it would be new. And I thought, if I could write a book which somehow did that, which put you back in it, then that would be a, a, a great challenge. Um, and then the other bit, and it's so how often it happens within writing, which is the serendipity, is that after these few weeks on my own, my, my daughters came out. They'd been on holiday with their dad, and they came out to join me for a week. And they were at the time 10 and 13. And by the time they arrived, I knew everything there was to know about the Italian Renaissance in Florence. And I <laughs> thought it would be really good if I told them so then they could go back to school, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I took them out on the first day, and I stood them in Santa Croce Square, and I said, now look, guys, today I'm going to take you to museums and art galleries and churches, and I'm going to show you the wonder of what happened here 500 years ago to turn this provincial, blah, 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 right. And the 13-year-old turned around and said to me, something which is now family law, I think you should know, Mum, that at this time in my life, I don't do culture, I just do shopping. <laughs> The 10-year-old, whose sort of job it was to get up the nose of the 13-year-old, said, oh, that sounds really interesting, I'll come. And as I started to walk with them, I thought, oh my God, I have such a hard sell on my hands because everything that I'm going to show these two 
feisty, aggressive young woman has a man's name attached to it. All the buildings, all the art, all the political thinkers, all the religious thoughts. Did women have a renaissance? What was it like to be half of the population during that? And that's when the idea for the birth of Venus came, which is the idea that God did not just give genius to men, and there must have been young women in that city with the potential talent to draw and paint and the desire to do so. Now, there's very good reasons why we don't find them, because it's a male profession and it's very physical and difficult. But what would be her story? And so it was the collision of those things. And then, of course, I needed to find the images. So I went out deliberately into all of this art going, where are the women? Where are the women? And the, uh, the wonderful thing is, for you, is that this hadn't really been done before. So that you, you not only had you found a wonderful resource for fiction, because these are fictionalized, historical, historically accurate, and very, very well-researched books, but you were able to shed light not just on women, but also on, the, on this particular period, the Renaissance and women. Yes. Well, what is so happened, rich? You see, so I, rich. I studied history uh, at university 325 years ago, um, and because you were at Cambridge, uh, that you mentioned the footlights yes, you were at Cambridge. Yes, um, but but the history I studied, and many of you will recall this um, if you're of any age to do so, which is the history was largely dead white male. Then, I mean, the, the, there's been a revolution in the teaching and the learning of history in these 30 or 40 years since then. And we have asked a series of questions about who was on the margins and what were their lives. So I, of course, went flouncing back into the library going, I've got this great idea, where are the women? And there were two generations of feminist scholars going, yeah, we've been writing about it. But of course, what they were writing was academic stuff that would never, by definition, find a popular audience. They were analyzing convent chronicles or court records where women's names came up for witchcraft or whatever. They were even analyzing women painters. There's a woman painter called Platilla Neri, who is, a, who is a, a Carmelite nun, who paints extraordinary stuff. So I had this gold dust of all the research they had done with which I could create fictional characters but who grew out of the soil of fact. What do you think all your novels have in common, the Italian um, Renaissance novels, if you like, the trilogy initially? Because, I mean, they, obviously they're all about women. Um, they show women in lots of different contexts, of marriage and um, nobility, if you like, the convent too. But what, what do they have in common? Because this is obviously a passion of yours too, and it's something that you've had all, all along. I think it's about the joined up writing of history, actually. We live in an era where history has become extremely popular again, but very often it's kind of celebrity history. We find a famous person in history and we do the biography of them or we show a journey which shows them through a TV documentary or whatever. And one of the things, and I came to history, my adoration of history came when I was a teenager through reading fiction because it was an imaginative entry into something that was not just a series of dates. It was about the kind of emotion of living in a different time. Who did, who did you read? I mean, I, re I remember reading Jean Plady. Yeah, And loving all of her. Jean Plady. And, that, and, she, and in fact, before I was reading you, I was thinking it was actually Jean Plady I was reading most and they of. were extraordinary, mostly women writers, mm -hmm. and they turned out a whole load of fascinating books, but on the basis of the history that they had at their fingertips, right? And the history has changed now. Um, and then, of course, I went to Cambridge, where I had the romance of history beaten out of me because it was an academic discipline. And I really appreciated that because I came out thinking, yeah, it's not just pretty clothes and my heart beats more when he comes into the room and is he a duke or whatever. It's <laughs> about the fact that we grow out of politics and culture and religion and economy. You know, just like if you were creating a character now, you would have to understand 2016 for them to have veracity. So when I started to go back into fiction, I thought, OK, if you're going to believe in these women, then they have to come from the roots of their own culture, their own religion. You know, this is a time when you know, the word atheist doesn't exist. The box is Catholicism, and you believe in it, and that's your world picture. So there were lots and lots of challenges mm -hmm. is to getting the history right, and then the kind of alchemic moment of the fiction where if you're really lucky and you do it right, you don't notice you're being taught it, right? 
I tell you a story, right? You want to know what it is about this young woman, Alexandra, who's bolshy and 14 and can speak Greek better than her brothers, but who wants to paint and she can't get her hands on the wall. And so everything I'm telling you about her is true. Silver point, boxwood, what she uses, what she wears, what she feels, what she thinks about God. But you don't care about that because you want to find out what happens next. And that, for me, is the power of historical fiction. And it has to be rooted in the history because why would you make it up? The history is so remarkable. Why would you make now it you up? You based um, your women. You've got, th you've got four main um, female characters across the four books. So you've got, um, you've got a courtesan, you've got a nun, um, you've got Lucrezia Borgia, who is a real person, obviously. But you changed, I think, you've, you found out some new and exciting um, elements about her life. And then um, right at the beginning, um, you had... Um, Alessandra. Alessandra. So what we're going to do now is we've got um, some extraordinary, very, very beautiful images to show you of the period. And the wonderful thing is they're chronological, um, and there's a reason for that as well, because Sarah's books were also written in chronological fashion. Sarah, you're going to start off, um, this okay. is this fantastic collage. Um, I'm going to start off with the place that started for me, right? I'm wandering around Florence Go, where are the women? Where are the women? Where are the women? Um, and I come across a, uh, a chapel in Santa Maria Novella. Um, this is a big church near the station. There's no excuse not to go in Which there. Which nobody right ever in, goes so. into. Exactly. The major chapel is the uh, Capella Maggiore, and it's painted in 1480s by Ghirlandaio with Michelangelo as his 15-year-old apprentice. And it was there that I found this picture. And, and of course, because I've now primed you for it, you'll see what arrested me about it. It's, it's very close. You're, this is the chapel. You're standing here, and it's there. Now, so here's the deal about this period. Um, they're all religious stories that are being painted right? Uh, there, there isn't any other art. We haven't got Botticelli's Birth of Venus yet. We're not painting mythology. We're churning out religious stories. But of course, they don't take place in Galilee anymore. They take place in Florence at the contemporary moment when they're being painted, because they're partly propaganda to this burgeoning economy based on material, based on fabric. That's where Florence's wealth comes from. And the people who commission it want to be on the walls. So this is the birth of the, the Virgin. It's a whole series of the Virgin's life. So actually, the this, Virgin is the birth. Is the this baby. is the birth of, uh, of Mary. Yeah, this yes, is the birth of Mary. Mary. But yeah. that's Mary, yes. right? So that's Mary's mum. Yeah. And that's Mary, fabulous baby, and, right? And lots of midwives and people. Yes, but this is Homes and Gardens, Florence, 1488, <laughs> right? You could <laughs> reconstruct a palazzo of that moment from looking at these paintings. And then, of course, you could reconstruct the fashion of the time. So there are a couple of proper saints up there. Um, that's Mary and Elizabeth meeting. They're very sophisticated. They, they can handle more than one person in a, in a story. They read them like film, right? We think, oh gosh, poor them, they're still pictures. But they put moving images into them all the time. And here we have, of course, the Turner Boynu family, because they paid for it, right? So, and here we have the difference between older women and the young women. Here, indeed, is the, the daughter-in-law of the family who is pregnant and who will die in childbirth. She will never live to see this painting done. So let me show you another one from this equal series. Now, do you see what I'm seeing? I'm, I'm just, first of all, I, I'm beginning to see, as with all of them, character within the faces, right? Um, and I'm beginning to see exactly what they're wearing and in such detail that you can reproduce these as costumes. You can actually take them off the walls, you can look at the stitching, and the job of the artist here is to say, thank you very much to the Turner Boynus. Uh, here you have a couple of stories of religious figures, but here you have the movers and shakers of Florence on the wall, right? And this is what they were wearing, and this is how much money they had in order to wear it. And they're becoming tremendously good at um, the way they handle cloth, too. This is a serving wench coming in. I love what she's got on her 
head there, this beautiful basket of fruit. And he's Girandayu is creating movement by the flowing of her gown. So you're watching. I mean, this is, of course, the moment. People weren't painting like this even 50 or 60 years before. They were, Mary was holding an anatomically challenged baby Jesus because <laughs> they hadn't really got three dimensions. And there was yet. a lot of gold leaf. Uh, yeah. And the, this, I mean, this, this for me is, and I was looking at these earlier again uh, today, and they are about, even though they're wearing very beautiful costumes, it's about daily life. Yes. It's about um, women's lives, you know, every day, what they eat, what they drink, how they dress, even though it looks as though it's against a, a theatrical stage set. Yes, yes. And, and actually, you know, that's, that's the scene. That's what you would have at a birth. That's what the bed would look like. There wouldn't be any men there. The others would be visiting. There'd be a kind of serving wench. There's very little furniture in this place, you know. But so... And these are frescoes, too, on yes. the walls, which is remarkable, if you think of it, too. And, you see, they really knew what they had. We have a diary entry from an apothecary who has a, a, a pharmacy near one of the palazzos here. And in 1490, he writes in his diary, they open the Cabela Maggiore this week by Ghirlandaiu. It cost 100,000 florins to do. So there's a sense in which the city's proud of what it's producing, enough for somebody like that to write it in his diary. So you get a sense of the sort of cut of the cloth, the cut of their jaw, <laughs> the kind of confidence mm -hmm. of their step. And then you've just got levels of detail. I just thought I'd show you, look, his sleeves, right? This is um, Leonardo da Vinci's Annunciation. Look at the intricacy of the design of that sleeve. Look at this, which is Tobias and the angel. These two sleeves together, that's the angel's sleeve in a kind of damask with that there, and that's Tobias. And I just couldn't resist this. I've been writing some BBC talks recently, and I wrote one on the fish handbag um, <laughs> that I saw in a Botticini exhibition, um, because Tobias carries a fish handbag. It was a talk about how you have to understand religious iconography a bit if you're going to get the Renaissance. So Tobias needed the handbag. And then I want to show you this because we let's, were talking about Let's Alexander. dwell on this absolutely beautiful, beautiful picture. Now, this is also Ghirlandaio. It is Ghirlandaio, and yes. Did, did you, f this is your Alessandra from the birth of Venus. It is now. It is it now. when I wrote so the you book, didn't, actually. So you saw her afterwards. You saw I saw all those Girandayu women, and I just loved them. I just thought he's got something. He's, you know, there's an affection here. He's a remarkable painter, isn't yeah, he, too? Yeah, he's not be well enough now. No, I mean, look, there's a exactly. real problem with this period, and it's called Michelangelo, Botticelli, and Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> Sorry, v and yeah. But, you know, <laughs> nobody else gets a look in, and mm. there are at least 20 or 30 of them who are extraordinary mm. but because they didn't get picked up at a certain moment they kind of languish in art history which makes them wonderful to discover but it's so unfair you know fame is not fair um, and uh, she now here's something to start a campaign on email we have her she's in the National Gallery but she's in storage isn't that atrocious mm. right um, and what I loved about her was she's clearly very young. She's obviously 13 or 14, right? Um, in terms of her clothes, let me just show you this. That is a kind of transparent lawn, which is a bodice going over the top of it. Now, first of all, the painting of that's extraordinary. And secondly, imagine the fineness of the lawn. That's coming from Northern Europe. I remember there's a line I wrote in The Birth of Venus where the father's a cloth merchant and he brings it back and he says, the women of Reims go blind in the, surface of in the service of beautifying my daughters. Mm -hmm. And so the, the level, we can't do cloth like this anymore. We don't even know how they did it. She has coral around her neck, which is a statement of purity. And there was something about her self-containment you know that moment when 13, 14, you stop being a child and you have a burgeoning sense of self, but you're not quite sure what it is, but things aren't working for you in the same way, and there's an element of the Bolshe arriving. And for me, she really summed that mm. up. She's a quite extraordinary. So this is Florence. You spent um, the first, your first novel takes place in Florence. Yes. And Florence, as you said earlier, was one of the main um, cities, uh, textile centers of the Renaissance. So it started off as a wool, 
city, yeah. and then it became a silk city. Yeah, and it becomes a dying city. And then it becomes That's a dying what city. what they do. They yes. bring in cloth from all over Europe. They take it into these vast vats right down by the river. The place where I now live in Florence is a very old working class district. You can tell because the stairs are very steep when you try and climb up them. Um, and that's where the dyeing and weaving would have been done, beca the dyeing because it's near the water. You can um, see, first of all, there is a transition because I hope you're noticing hair. Um, yeah. Sarah's got a big theme about hair, but it is, it's amazing if you think how long it took to do just that simple style. Well, of course, any woman in the audience knows how long hair can take. Um, I, I, I'm old enough to remember that I used to iron mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I used to bathe mine in vinegar. It stank. Yeah, you see, well, yeah. actually, that, that, I mean, we'll, we'll look, we'll, here we go. So, hair is, of course, a statement of sexuality. Now, you won't have seen, you, you, if you have seen the Botticelli exhibition, you may not have thought of hair, but there is a lot of it. Yes. Um, um, now, uh, so, a couple of things. Fair hair, of course. We're in Italy. People don't have fair hair. Most of the people have dark hair. So, of course, your definition is what nobody has of beauty, right, which is fair hair. And so you look at the ways in which they try and dye their hair. They soak it in vinegar, they rinse it in this and that, and they even have a hat, which is a hole in the head here, and a wide brim, and they shove all their hair out of the hat, <laughs> and then they go up on the roof and bake their hair. Because, of course, they need white skin. Because white skin is the fact that you're an aristocrat and you don't work. So they need the fair hair dyed. So they're sweating up there in these hats in order to make it. And when I was writing The Courtesan, it takes a whole day for her to do her hair. Okay? But here's the deal. This is Venus. Guess who this is? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So this is, you know, <laughs> hair can do what you want erotically. And that's Titian painting Mary Magdalene with that look to God. But the difference... And her breasts sticking out from her hair. But the difference already is between um, Ghirlandaio and Botticelli, where um, this is quite stylized, obviously, and yes. metaphorical. And then with Ghirlandaio, it's all naturalism and, you know, everyday life. Um, and, and, the, and this is, you know, and, and nudity. Because yes. surely nudity itself was completely... Uh, well, it hadn't been painted. Well, if, if you think about it, often. Uh, think about it, what you've got is Eve, okay? Uh, so, and Eve's nudity becomes shame because it becomes Eve's fault. I've always wondered about that. I've always thought that, like, here's Adam and Eve, and they know they're not supposed to eat the apple, and Eve gets hold of the apple, and she says to Adam, have a bite. And he doesn't go, you're not supposed to have that, Eve. Put it down. He goes, thanks, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> And like it's Eve's fault, um, so there's quite a lot to be done on Eve. But um, so anyway, but of course you will remember when I showed you those pictures of the women, which is the women after they get married can't show their hair. There's some understanding that hair is very erotic and sexual, and so they start having to do other things with their hair. I'll show you some wonderful images of hair. I think this might be in the exhibition, the Botticelli. Mm. I seem to this remember. This is um, Simonetta Vespucci. Yes, yeah. it is. But I mean, look at the. Who was, who was meant to be one? The, she was the great beauty, wasn't she, of that yes, particular period? Yes, she is about the only person that he paints too. I mean, yeah. don't get me started. Look at the level of the plaiting of the pearls inside it. Look at the straightness. Look at the crimp. I mean, this would have taken a long time. She didn't do it herself before going off to work, okay? Um, <laughs> this is another wonderful painting by Pogliaio. Um, and I, the thing I love about this is, look at this around her hair. So you've got the, this, the almost transparent net here. And pearls. Is everywhere. her head shaved at the back there, or is it just... Her head will be shaved up here. Right. Um, the, the, the notion of perfect beauty was quite a lot of skin here. Um, so they would have been, it w actually, they wouldn't have been shaved, they would have been plucked. Ooh. Yes, right, no waxing even. Um, but but I, think, I think that's an extraordinary mm. portrait. So that's hair. That's <laughs> hair, yes. Well, I mean, it is, because it, it, it's, it's interesting how, uh, you know, how much emphasis is placed on hair and hose and... No, um, nudity, but no breasts at the moment. I haven't yes. seen a naked breast at all, yes. apart from uh, 
uh, Botticelli. Yes. And the, the fact, this is ideal beauty as well, too. Um, yes, they had a version of the Platonic here because they're rediscovering Plato, which is part of the kind of intellectual rebirth of the Renaissance. And the Platonic suggests, of course, that there is an ideal sense of a thing that is never real and you will never find, but you can aspire to. So they had an idea of the platonic in women, which is that if women were beautiful, it somehow reflected their inner souls, right? Mm -hmm. This didn't seem to apply to men, who could be extremely ugly and apparently good and powerful. Um, but, and it was another stick to beat women with to a certain extent, which is you, if you weren't beautiful, then somehow you weren't as worthy as you could be. You do have a very ugly man, um, I think, to show us next. I do, well, actually, you, do you think he's ugly? You see, I think physically, but because of the amazing costume he's wearing. All right, okay. Uh, when I, uh, I, I do a lecture when I talk about the books, and when I move from Florence to Venice, uh, one of the things I say is I could show you a million different pictures of Venice, and you'll have seen them because it's a very famous city. But actually, at the time I'm writing, it's really powerful. It really is. And nobody's sinking in Venice. There's not a problem there. Um, and I show this instead. Now, this one is on show in the National Gallery. He's not pretty. I think he's gorgeous. <laughs> I think his costume, I think his extraordinary clothing. Now, this is actually the Doge of Venice. Um, Doge Loridan of Venice. Lo Doge Loridan. And um, it's by a painter called Giovanni Bellini, who's uh, probably the greatest of the Venetian painters. Give me him over Titian any day. Um, but actually, what's really interesting about this is that's power. That's the beauty of power, right? So you couldn't get a woman of that age looking like that, you know, what do you see? You see wisdom and sagacity. You see Venice, uh. right? But partly what you see is pomp and circumstance and pomp and ceremony. This is so brilliantly painted. I think it's probably one of the great portrait painters, paintings anywhere. And uh, if you go into the National, you can get it on computer and you can blow it up. So you can see the level of detail that there is in each of these buttons, or the way the light is on the damask, and the way each of the stitching takes place. So, but so it's propaganda. Mm -hmm. It's saying, through my clothes, I am Venice, and Venice is the main man. Now, with these, I mean, you can see um, the extraordinary skill as well, because these cities became famous um, textile and costume cities because of the concentration of artisans and skills and um, wonderful looms, of course, because all of this was woven silk. Yes. Yes. And, um, and patterned and woven silk. So three or four people would have to be using the loom at the same time in order to create this, yes. this, this extraordinary effect. It would take you know, months to create something like this. And, and of course, course, only a few people could afford it anyway. Yeah, and of course, ve you know, Venice is also at the hub. We're just on the part where Columbus is going to start shifting the power base of trade. But Venice is the hub. Everything's coming in from everywhere to Venice. And, you know, I, I read letters, which I've been doing recently on the Borgia book, from Isabella d'Este, who's a real icon of fashion, going, I've heard the, the boat is in with the new Ita Indian silks. Get down there to the quay because the colors are supposed to be incredible. So there's a great deal of extraordinary stuff coming in from all over the world. Um, it's not just what's happening in Italy. Mm -hmm. But, but it, it started there, and it was, um, you know, it was a particularly powerful part of the textile industry, and it yes. moved on to France and so on thereafter. But the, you can see it's velvets and silks, and um, they are often embellished with real gold and real silver, um, and with pearls as well. Extraordinary gold thread. detail. And gold um, thread. You will have noticed, of course, that all of women's clothes come down to here. Um, so the, the, the sexuality of women is n not the legs, and you will know this well throughout history, it's not the legs. Um, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> but the sexuality of men is the legs, right? This is a painting by Carpaccio, who uh, is a contemporary of Bellini's. And um, once again, what we have here, we have a scene from the life of St. Ursula. St. Ursula actually isn't in this, but it doesn't really matter, because it takes place in the Rialto in Venice, 
right? So once again, you've got an excuse for a, isn't Venice an extraordinary city and how do we strut our stuff on the Rialto? Um, you will note there aren't a lot of women. Respectable women aren't really allowed out a lot. We'll come to respectability in a moment. So this is the kind of strutting ground for men. And you will see uh, from here that leg is extremely important. Now, of course, leg is, is potency. Um, because of the cod piece. It's actually drawing attention to potency. But you can read a lot about the beauty of the leg in men. Um, and in Venice, actually, by the time you reach 25 or 26 and become a senator, you start to have to wear long clothes, right? So the young bloods are the ones with the legs. And if I show you this, <laughs> you will see what I mean. I think there's a bit of photoshopping going on here, actually, because of course they don't have lycra, right? So these will have been fine woolen hose or sometimes silk, but you never see the creases, but there would have been creases. Um, th this is a very famous, forgive me, but this is a very famous pose for Renaissance artists. It shows how well they do foreshortening. And of course, what's really interesting about this is um, I'm writing about Florence during the 1490s when I'm writing about the birth of Venus when there is a, a fundamentalist monk running the government uh, uh, at the end of the Medici period and he's railing in his sermons against something called sodomy. It's Savonarola. Yeah, Savonarola. And I'm reading all these sermons and I'm reading everybody railing about sodomy and I'm thinking, whoa, oh, I see. There's quite a lot of sodomy about then, right? <laughs> And interestingly, one of the greatest new bits of research over the last 20 years has been a book by an American PhD scholar studying the night police, whose job throughout the 15th century in Florence is to go into dark alleys after, you know, and find out what's going on. And of course it's sex, and some of it's heterosexual prostitution, but quite a lot of it is same sex. And I think sometimes when I look at these paintings, that one's actually looking at something that could cut both ways in terms of what men were seeing as well as women. And it's interesting, I'm not going to show it to you, but guess who's up there? That's Saint Sebastian. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but I've yet to see a Saint Sebastian that isn't a homoerotic image, right? But he's really enjoying martyrdom <laughs> with his entire body. And so I think you can read between the lines of some of this, partly through the fashion, partly through the religious iconography, a whole substrata which you're not supposed to know about, but which, if you look deep enough, is obviously going on. Now, you know, actually, mm -hmm. interestingly, Botticelli, who, after he's painted all those gorgeous nudes, follows Savonarola and Chuck's work on the bonfire. In 1502, he's denounced in a box in one of the churches as having had a gay relationship. Nobody knows if it's a scandalous denou de denouncement or what. But so the sexuality isn't as obvious as it looks. There's Christ here, and that means you behave well, and homosexuality is illegal. It, mm. It's, it's mm. more confusing. It's more interesting than that. And that's, of course, what you've been, what you've been uh, writing about, too. There's a lot of sex in your books. Um, no, which, really, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> Very entertaining. Um, no, it, I mean, they're, 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 they are real page turners as well, too. But, and I was wondering how you decide what descriptive elements you're going to include, because you, you aren't just writing about clothes. You aren't just writing about paintings or... Um, you're writing about cities, you're writing about religion, you're writing about these extraordinary women. So how do you decide, for instance, about costume, what, well, what you're I going to you include? I think you probably tell. I mean, you've seen all these images. They're, they're, they're the, the images are fermenting in me as I start to write. So in, in The Birth of Venus, because she wants to paint and she's trying to paint, and she's trying to paint her, her own enunciation at a certain point with her servant kind of standing in for the angel Gabriel or Mary, depending on which, with bits of drapery in. She's looking at fabric, right? She's trying to understand how you paint fabric. Her father's a, a fabric merchant, so she's thinking about things like that. And for me, it's a way, it's a way of bringing to life otherness. You know, I sometimes think writing historical fiction is a bit like writing science fiction backwards. 
everything's strange, but it all has to fit together. And it has to be really colorful and you have to sink into it. And so costume's only one part of that. But, but it is so detailed. I'm just, I want to just show you this one because even the kids, right? E even the children were dressed absolutely perfectly. Now, a costume designer can remake these clothes from looking at where the pleats are. Do you remember cloth kits? No. Oh, some, a few of you do. I mean, those are almost cloth kits, aren't they? They're, you could actually just make um, the costumes, you just you know, sew them together from these cut out pieces of fabric which are sent to you in the post. Oh, really? It was a really popular um, form of dressmaking. Okay. By the way, were, were you ever a dressmaker? Did you I, ever make your own clothes? I once crocheted a dress. Okay. It had sort of quite a lot of holes in it, actually. <laughs> but it was the late 60s <laughs> when holy crocheted dresses were acceptable. It was when I was ironing my hair. No. <laughs> you managed to crochet at the same yes, time. Yes, and I used to sing Sandy Shaw covers with <laughs> my feet bare. You're a woman of so many <laughs> talents. Uh, when I went looking for women that very first time in Florence, I found that incredible whole fresco. And then I found this which is in the Brancacci Chapel. It's painted in the 1420s by an artist called Masaccio who dies at the age of 27. And he's really the first. The people he puts on the walls are flesh and blood, and the extras have as much life as the religious figures. He's the one who sends Adam and Eve in pain and horror out of paradise right, because they've sinned and it's just filled with dark emotion. But I loved her because, because she's just an ordinary working woman, right, who would be loud on the street. And I also loved um, that baby's bottom. <laughs> because just in case you need to know it, they didn't have nappies then. And as so often happens, once you spot something, you then see it everywhere. So um, I've got a friend who's doing a, a PhD on black sub-Saharan Africans in the Renaissance. She shows you one painting, every painting you can see somebody of color, which you never noticed before. And there's a lot of babies mm -hmm. in frescoes, and they're all toddling around, mm -hmm. kind of with a dog going after them, right? <laughs> and they're all without nappies. <laughs> so that's just my... Now, this actually moves on very, very, very well to um, your next topic, which is about um, also your, your second book, I think it yes. was, um, In the Company of the Courtesan. Yes. Um, it's about prostitution. It's about courtesans um, in Venice, yes. in particular. Yes. And it's um, your Fiametta, the main character in the book, is based on a very well-known um, courtesan of the time, I think, yes. Angela Del Moro. Yes. Um, and her relationship with Titian. Yes. Um, um, Let's see what we've got. This, um, as this far is as such a strange this painting. This is a very strange portrait. Yeah. So um, Venice, Venice is a very good sex trade city because uh, ports always are, aren't they? But yeah. actually there's a, a structural reason for this. Courtesans are so interesting, okay, right? Because this is a very, very, very Catholic society. And for instance, in Rome, which is just filled with the curia, the administration of the Catholic Church, you have a whole lot of men who cannot get married. They are celibate. It doesn't appear to mean that they are chaste. Mm. So what happens during the late 15th century is you see a courtesan culture growing up, which these are not working class prostitutes, some of whom would have syphilis by now because syphilis is just arriving. They are women of reasonably humble birth who've been well educated, who are gorgeous for a period of time, who have some skills in conversation or whatever, and who become the people who are willing to sleep with the cardinals, even the popes or whatever, and not expect marriage. They just expect to be kept. And Venice has something similar going on, because Venice is an oligarchy, and it has very few families at the top, right? And to keep their control on the top, they have to control the number of children being had. It's easy with the women, you just shove them into convents, right? Uh, but the men become professional bachelors. So they're not allowed to marry because that would mean the line would continue and the fortunes would be dissipated, but they are allowed to have sex. And so courtesan culture works very well in Venice too. And we think 
that this is a portrait of two courtesans. We're very confused. Although it's, it is quite, it is, it is contested that, isn't it? Because the, the whole books have been written about this um, particular because painting. Because there's lots of symbols like doves, which could be purity. And the white scarves. Yes, and the white scarves. But, um, but I think this is one of the giveaways, which is these incredible shoes. The, um, the, the Chopin, Chopin shoes, yes, yes, which I'll show you they're, some They're afterwards. big clogs, as you can right. see. Um, and they have a sort of bored, waiting for the client look about them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I rather <laughs> like. Dare I point out breasts? Yes, yes, you um, may. You know, yeah, Venice was particularly well known for its low cut dresses um, in that time, but also the court courtesans were about the only women who were allowed to wear um, such low cut dresses. Yes, and there were, of course, attempts to stop them looking like Venetian noble women, right? Because they're courtesans. Um, so there's laws passed by the Venetian state again and again, so they're clearly not working, going, they are not allowed to be on the street in pearls, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go, it's all pearls. Um, and they are not allowed to go to church and sit next to anybody who comes from a good family. So where do you find all the courtesans? In church, right? And in fact, <laughs> in the company of the courtesan, there's a scene which takes place in the church when she talks about how if you dress properly and you wave your perfume around, mm. you can attract merchants who've come for confession and are feeling good about themselves and are <laughs> ready to shift things. But of course, what they usually look like is this. Um, this is a, a wonder, wonderful, um, I, I found this at a costume book, right? So. This is interesting. Look, they appeal to both. Okay? Um, so, and these are the fantastic shoes. Okay? Do you remember the, in the Alexander McQueen exhibition? I mean, he actually had adopted um, this, I mean, obviously loved this particular style. I love this idea, actually. It's so sensible. Well, what do you mean sensible? You can't walk in them. Well, you can at least stand across, uh, you know, atop all the muck and the D mud um, and the... Anyone remember glam rock in the 70s? Yeah. You the platform shoes? Oh, absolutely. The very first job I had at the BBC, mm. I once, after a meeting where somebody had eviscerated a programme I'd made, got up and fell off my platform <laughs> shoes <laughs> and hit my head on the desk of the editor, oh. who'd actually been really unpleasant to me but didn't intend to concuss me. Oh. So, but it was quite an interesting. Gosh, very experience. dramatic. Um, but but because yes, they, they they, and they would be about that high. They wouldn't. So yes. I don't think we would be wearing those, yes. actually. And of course, they were practical in Venice because there was flooding. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you could walk through the floods, mm. too. Yeah. Uh, but this is what you're sort of waiting for mm. because this is what courtesans were really about. Uh, this is a really interesting portrait. You know it, of course. It's, Tish, it's um, Titian's Venus of Urbino. Um, we don't know very much about it. We don't know if it's about a marriage chest or whatever. But what we do know is she's the first na if naked woman, naked Venus, who's directly looking at you. Okay, there's a whole set of Venuses up until now who are mm. looking at themselves in the mirror or asleep or reading a book, and they know you're looking, mm. right? But mm. they're pretending that they don't. She is, you like what you see, make mm. me an offer. And we know now from Titian's letters that she was a courtesan who'd left Rome after the sack of Rome and had settled in Venice. And Titian used a lot of courtesans for his models. Um, indeed, she's so famous, but I don't know whether you know this, which is her again, but with clothes on. And I, I, I think the collision of those two, that beautiful sort of, sort of heart-shaped face with that lovely piece of um, top and then that. So this is actually your character as well, really, Fiametta. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. And did you see that before? I, that's, yeah, that's in the Uffizi, not the, the, the Venus of Urbina is in the Uffizi. Yes. And I just looked at her and thought, who are you? The confidence with which you are lying there means that you know what you're doing. Yes. Um, as indeed they did. But I, I, it was a precarious life. You know, they, didn't, they weren't successful for very long. But when they were successful, they were very successful and would have looked beautiful. Mm. You know, they would have had all the accoutrements. I mean, and by this stage, by this stage, the co the, really the painting of costume is so amazing. This is Veronese, who's painting a little later than Titian. And his ability, both with color and drapery, 
to give you a sense of the weight of the fabric or what the fabric is made of. And of course, interestingly, um, they're both still kind of religious figures. This is St. Catherine's mystical marriage. And this is Lucretia, the Roman martyr who killed herself rather than um, give in to uncle you know, unclean advances. But actually, you don't really notice that, do you? You're too busy with the bling. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think when you get to this stage, you just stand in awe. There was a Veronese exhibition at the National Gallery a few years ago, um, and it, it, it was just stunning. Mm. You just thought you couldn't photograph like this. And actually, that's a very interesting question. Is this realistic or is this heightened? You know, if this is partly their fashion mm. propaganda. But that's also another big aspect of Renaissance paintings, of costume, I think, is this um, the reproduction of costume. Because you look at portraits of, say, um, Eleanor of Toledo, yeah. which is the, the wonderful one in the Uffizi as well, which is one of my favorite paintings of all time, actually. I love that one. Um, and you can just see... see every single thread almost yes. and the richness and you know just of the colors but also the weaving and how heavy these clothes yes. were because these clothes well, you know by the 17th century they were wearing much lighter clothes but you can see the levels you've got the little blouses the camicia and so on which and the the veils but these brocades these heavy heavy brocades which later would also find their find themselves on walls as well. They'd be decorating walls. So these were, these were really difficult to wear. And also, of course, fabric is one of the things that doesn't make it through history. Mm. It disintegrates. You know, mm. when these guys finished wearing these, they'd go probably go to second-hand dealers. The second-hand clothes market was run in Venice by the Jewish community because they weren't allowed to do any other jobs, right? So they would be recycled and recycled, and then gradually they would fall apart. And it's very, very, very hard. Sometimes you find it in ecclesiastical garments yeah. that have been kept over the years, and you can see the level of the work of uh, mm. gold and silver threads or whatever. Um, and uh, costume restorers, of course, are doing amazing yeah. jobs. Oh, I just wanted to show oh, you yes. this one thing. Do you dwarf. remember that picture <laughs> I showed you of the Rialto, right? Um, in the Company of the Courtesan is not narrated by Fiametta because... She was out for herself. These were not young prototype feminists. They were busy women trying to kind of make their careers. Um, so I couldn't find anyone to tell her story because I didn't think you'd like her if she told it herself. And so I did literally find the narrator for this book in the academia. And it was in that picture I showed you of the Rialto. And I was standing there looking at it, checking out all the faces, and I saw him. Okay, <laughs> and he is clearly a dwarf, right? Mm. Once you've seen one, you see them everywhere in Renaissance art. It's fantastic, and right? This is your Buccino. This is my Buccino. And I remembered, this is how, if you like, the creative process works. I remembered as I saw him, something I'd read in the British Library about three months before about courtesan culture, which is that apparently they kept exotic pets mm. to entertain their clients. So they kept monkeys or jugglers, and they kept dwarves who were half jesters or whatever. And I saw him and I thought, right, well, whoever you're working for, they're doing well. Mm. And uh, you may be small in stature, but it doesn't mean you're small in brain. And you're probably going to be the one man in this whole story who's not going to sleep with the courtesan because mm. she needs you to be a partner and you're the voice that can tell her story. And that was literally studying the art and studying the fashion mm. that gave me him. No, it's, that's an amazing story as well too. And that, that actually, I know maybe it's the wrong um, connotation, but I suddenly thought of Game of Thrones too. Have films been made of your, your books? They no. Could, they should be. No. I well, actually, um, The Birth of Venus is now ac in development, as we say, in development. Speriamo. Yes. And, it's, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a very interesting thing because, of course, I think costume will be part of character. Yes. You know. Um, I, there I'm are very some, happy to be your advisor on them. There, <laughs> there are some <laughs> fabulous <laughs> costume designers out there. And yes, if you really think are. about how the past comes alive for you, mm. it's, it's how everything from the script to the directing and the... And actually, um, the, 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 
the people who are interested in making it um, are, are now Shoebox Film and Working Title. And Shoebox Film, the director involved is Joe Wright. Now, Joe Wright did both Atonement and Pride and Prejudice. And Anna and, Karenina and as Anna well. Anna Karenina. Which, now, and the costume in that. three of those yes. have remarkable levels of veracity when it comes to costume. And I think particularly of Pride and Prejudice, where I felt those young women were wearing clothes that they had worn every day of their lives. And that, of course, is the balance. Joe Wright's Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. That was yes. the Kira Knightley one. Yes, That's it was. It yes. was. Because sometimes when you look at these, you think, well, they're all strutting their stuff to show you how brilliantly they're wearing their clothes. But what's it like when they have a pee? Or, you know, they go, <laughs> you know, what's it like to wear these clothes every minute of the day? And how do they live in them? And so I think that's a real interesting. Oh, well, let's challenge. really, really hope that happens. Because yeah, I think meanwhile, how do they live in this? Oh, <laughs> yes. Now, this is um, basically linked with um, Sacred Hearts, which was your third book. Sacred Hearts tells you about life in a convent in Ferrara in Italy, in the 16th century. Mm -hmm. And um, it tells you things you'll never, ever have known before, because what Sarah does is research in minute detail. Um, and still make it entertaining. Um, it must have been an extraordinary um, research process for you. Did well, particularly this, because we didn't know anything about, I mean, this is the classic moment, you know. There's something like a half of all noble women by the middle of the 16th century are in convents because dowries are really expensive and you can't marry them off and they can't be allowed to live alone. So they're married to the one husband who'll take them, which is Jesus Christ, mm. right? Mm. Um, and boy, and do they love Jesus Christ in these convents. Right, and you vast know. numbers of them are in there. So what mm. was it like? And nobody had asked it before. Mm. Oh, there's convents. Mm. Um, but lots of work had been done on it. And part of the work, I mean, this is the classic propaganda. This is a wonderful portrait. It's by Moroni. I think it's really beautiful, this wonderful goiter that she has. I hope the nun looks after it. Um, she's a widow who's just founded a convent. And this is a very beautiful, this is a Spanish... Uh, artist I don't know very well. Inside the convents, they don't have to look like that. This is the propaganda. And quite a lot of them have sisters and aunts and, uh, or, and already in there. And you discover that when they do visitations on the convents, they discover that they've got silk petticoats on, mm -hmm. or that they've got décolleté mm -hmm. underneath the top, or that the wimp, my favorite is, that underneath the wimple's little curls <laughs> are coming down. So they're still noble women, and they still want to show some level of individuality, and they keep lap dogs mm. as pets. So there's a continual, it's like every set of rules, they're continually infringed mm. in order to show personality. Mm. At the same time, they're not allowed out of the convent. Except for the fact, if you think about, and this is how it works when you're thinking about the past, think about women's lives in the past. If they were the ones who got married, that meant at about the age of 13 or 14, they were married off. They were probably married off to a man considerably older than themselves. They certainly wouldn't have loved him. They might not even have known him. They would have been a kind of breeding cow now to have as many children as possible. Many of those children would have died in childbirth. They might have died in childbirth, and there's no room for them to have any life of their own outside being the wife of the male figure. The men can be off having affairs, they can't. Whereas very ironically, these women go into convents and yeah, there's not sex, although there is a bit. Mm. So this is the most evil woman in history, if you believe all the propaganda, uh, Lucretia Borgia. Um, she is, 13 years old, what a lovely double chin she has here, when her father becomes uh, Pope Alexander VI. She becomes a married pawn in his dynastic empire to create a, a new power house within central Italy, the Borgia family. They're Spanish, not Italian, and he's using the papacy to create it. Um, and I can just tell you one story about her as to how rumor becomes scandal and fact, because it's really like tabloid news this moment of history, which is the first person she's married to because they need an alliance with the North is Giovanni Sforza, right? Then she's 13. They don't consummate the marriage for a year, year and a half. And then two years later, he's on the wrong side and they need her out of the marriage, right? You can't get divorced because it's the Catholic Church unless your father is the Pope. 
Um, and so he brings up an idea that because she hasn't had children, that means the marriage has not been consummated, right? Everybody mm. knows the marriage has been consummated, but the Pope tells you it hasn't been consummated. Mm. And as long as she signs a document and there is an examination by midwives behind closed doors, you know, you can do this yourself, you know what's going on. And he, her husband, is so angry that he says to an ambassador, these words, I have known her an infinity of times, and the Pope only wants her back for himself. Mm. And bingo. By the end of the year, Lucretia is the biggest whore in Italy, mm. and she's having it off with her father. So you can mm. absolutely see the way it works. So and then she turns into this. Mm. You know, that's the nice version of it, and that's the nasty version of it. This is... Um Veneto, is it the painter, I think? Yes, it is. I don't Abs think it's her. I think it's no, after her no. death. But look at those curls. Yeah. But how, that's how the official photograph immediately turns into the killer. And you can read about Lucrezia Borgia in uh, Blood and Beauty, which is your fourth Italian novel, yeah. and you're writing the, the fifth. I've finished it. Uh, fantastic. I <laughs> um, look forward to that. I really enjoyed Blood and Beauty, and I'm glad you said you've written a sequel. I was just wondering when it might come out. Yes, it's taken it. quite a while, actually. <laughs> um, it'll be out next year. Um, and the reason it's taken quite a while is because it has turned out to be not just the story of the Borgias, it's turned out to be the story of Machiavelli. Because Machiavelli is a young diplomat at around the time when the Borgias are making this last out push for fame and territory. And Machiavelli actually follows in the footsteps of Cesare Borgia, and he writes back and writes letters and then writes finally The Prince, which is extrapolating out from what he learns as a young diplomat. So I had to get over that panic of, oh my God, I can't write Machiavelli, he's so famous, right? Mm -hmm. To realizing that actually it's not the Machiavelli that's become so famous, it's a 29-year-old diplomat in his first job. Mm -hmm and he's all eyes and ears, and he's taking it all in, and he's... But it's out next March. March. The publisher is sitting here, <laughs> which is always very useful and when, it's when the authors don't remember. In the name of the family. In the name of the... The family. And I was thinking briefly, in the name of the fabric, that would have yeah. been perfect, but <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> not quite. Um, have we got any... Porte. <laughs> <laughs> have we got any more questions? I was wondering, have you ever been to India, and have you ever studied the Mughal period? I, I certainly have been to India. I've been to India a number of times, um, and I, I never have studied it. I mean, what happens if you're really going to write about a period is you just sink deeper and deeper. Yeah. And the more you learn, the more you realize you don't learn. And, uh, and I don't think I'm ever going to be one of those writers who can write across six periods. Right, I okay. think I've landed. You've talked about women being painted. Have you ever come across the women who paint? Women painting? In the Renaissance? Yes. To name one, Artemisia Gentileschi. Yes. Uh, well, Artemisia Gentileschi... Could you, could you just repeat the question, yes. Sarah? Sorry. Women yeah. in painting, h how far that was possible. Artemisia Gentileschi is uh, about 150 years later, and sh the, one of the reasons it can work for her is her father is a painter. Um, and that seems to be one of the ways in. Paolo Uccello, who's painting in the middle of the 15th century, has a daughter mm. who is clearly very good and talented and stays in the workshop with him. And almost certainly her brush is on a lot of Paolo Uccello's work because it would be part of a workshop. But when she hits the age of 15, she's sent to a Carmelite convent. Um, and you will remember that Artelita Gentileschi goes through a terrible rape case because she is raped by uh, uh, somebody who's also working in the workshop. Um, Platilla Neri, who is this nun, who, and look her up, it's Platilla Nelli, N-E-L-L-I. -L the quality of her painting is fantastic, and she does all of that within the convent. And indeed, The Birth of Venus ends... Oh, have you finished it? Yes? Yeah. Um, <laughs> with this young... <laughs> with this woman who wants to paint in a convent for a period of time, and she does paint her own chapel. But one of the things it says at the end of the book, and it was really important to me, because I, didn't want to, I, don't, want to make, I don't want to fake history. She says at the end, oh, I've forgotten to tell you about my chapel. Well, it's okay. Mm. Uh, you know, I didn't have the training. It, 
could have been better. But actually, I lived through a chorus of voices of creativity. And so it, maybe it's OK to have been one of them. And I suppose that brings me back to what I wanted to say about how you don't hear so much about Ghirindayu or Pogliayu or Botticini or all those other people. It wasn't just superstars. It really wasn't. This brilliance grew out of hard work from a lot of people handing on their knowledge one to the other. And I hate the fact that it's all become about superstars. Sorry, v &A, mm. but it's, uh, <laughs> I, I do. We, we need to be more sophisticated about it. Now, this woman here, yes. and I'm going to have the, just the final word on this one. This is um, Isabella Deste. Yes. Now, if you want to know more about Isabella Deste, you're going to have to talk to Sarah afterwards as she signs her books. But Isabella Deste was one of the most important women of the Renaissance. She was a cultural and political figure, an absolutely massively important woman, and very, very well-dressed. She was painted by everybody from... Rubens, Titian, Da Vinci, um, yes. and was very, very famous. Yes, this is classic Photoshop, actually. So she's, Isabella Dessa is in her 50s, right? <laughs> and she writes to Titian, she gets everybody <laughs> right, she's a mover and shaker, and says, I want a portrait, because she's, look at her clothes. I mean, she's a walking vogue. Mm. She really is. Um, and uh, she gets, she's getting quite plump. Right? So Titian does a painting of her and sends it back, and she goes, oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I want something that makes me look better. So she, he se she sends him a picture taken of her done in her 20s and early 30s, and Titian dutifully turns out this. We don't know, about, but Rubens saw the original Titian and painted it, so she really looked like this. <laughs> so when we talk about Photoshopping, there are ways in which you can do it five centuries ago, <laughs> But also, I do think it's absolutely perfect that we end with a, a, a really fantastic woman, Isabella Deste, because I do think that uh, Sarah Dunant absolutely matches up to this <laughs> very, very <laughs> powerful, very interesting, cultural, political, wonderful figure. And I really can't thank you enough. I mean, we could... I know we always say this, we could go on forever. We really could go on forever. <laughs> um, thank you to Sarah Dunant thank for your you, enthusiasm and great writing and great images. Thank you so much. <laughs>